there's obviously genetics and there's obviously predis predisposition in the family genetic line coming from your mother and your father that can influence your own health. But our diet, the things we're exposed to, the toxins we're exposed to, the toxins we can eliminate from our lifestyle, all of these things contribute to who we are. And the, the ability of the human body to rejuvenate itself is phenomenal. With no limitations, what does your perfect day look like? What if it's possible to live like that every day? Would you wake up after 9am, have perfect health, maybe fire your boss, have the money and freedom to do what you love most? The world is your oyster. Where would you be? Who would you be with? The possibilities are endless. Whether you believe it's possible for you or not, you can make more, work less and live free. Welcome to Freedom Hack Radio, where entrepreneur, best-selling author, world traveler and adventurer, Bryce Robertson and special guests crack the code on money, health, relationships, spirituality and having fun doing what you love most. Be inspired to create your own self-designed freedom lifestyle. Welcome back to another episode of Freedom Hack Radio, where you learn to work less, make more, and live free. I'm your host, Bryce Robertson, and today we are going to talk about health and energetic healing. So you may remember in episode three, uh, health, we, we discussed the effects of our mental attitude and, and emotions that have on our health. Also, we talked about toxicity from our environment and our living conditions, and we talked about pH levels and their effect on our health. We also discussed the frequencies of food, and you know, we talked about radiation from microwaves. So I've researched these topics and their effects on our body, and I think it's super important uh, that we all know about this. And joining us today to discuss these topics in greater detail is our very special guest, Joanne Brown. For more than 12 years, Joanne has worked as a natural therapist in Queensland, Australia, using frequency-based therapies in conjunction with traditional Chinese medicine principles. She's also certified in bioresonance therapy. Joanne also works as an energy healer with intuitive clients to shift energetic blocks and make space for new possibilities. In her intuitive sessions, she also helps her clients to reduce the hold of toxins and pathogens with their energetic systems and their connections to disharmonious belief systems and emotions. In her work, she draws from both her natural therapy work and her engineering background and experience with microorganisms and toxins, namely uh, heavy metals and chemicals, and their interactions. Joanne sees the scientific and intuitive worlds as being on the same continuum rather than being polar opposites, and views her work as a bridge that, continue, that contributes to spanning the perceived divide between these worlds. Joanne provides distance sessions for her clients through her website, joedouglasbrown.com. She has helped hundreds of people in Australia, in the USA, Canada, and Europe through both in-house and distance therapy sessions. So, Joe, I'm super excited to have you on the show today, mate. Thanks for joining us. Hi there, Bryce. It's, it's great to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And, and Joe, I've got to know, uh, what's giving you the most gratitude today? Oh, just being able to wake up in, uh, I live in a beautiful um, rural community. It's a sapphire mining community. And it, each morning the cockatoos just start shrieking and, and begin the day. It's, um, it's a beautiful thing. That's awesome. That, it's so awesome. Yeah. So like, I have the same feeling. Like I wake up here, I hear the birds singing, I look outside, there's an abundant nature. It's such a good feeling. That's, that's really cool. I'm glad that you love what you yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. So you went from an engineering and science background to energetic healing. Can mm -hmm. you quickly tell us a little bit about your background and how that shift came about? Yeah. Uh, I've always been fascinated with how things work. Um, the engineering side, I think that came largely from my dad, but it was a bit of a transitional process because I was actually studying to be a civil engineer when I was having health problems. And I found that frequency therapies were 
um, providing me with the best results, even better than acupuncture, which really, really mm. surprised me. But the natural therapies were working for me in a way that the conventional medicine and pharmaceuticals weren't. So I really became immersed in learning and understanding why they were helping me and how they were helping me. And, and I also recognized at that time that there were emotional and spiritual components that contributed to my personal health. So in addition to having food allergies and um, toxicity from amalgams, you know, mercury fillings, mm -hmm. there were also emotional imbalances in my life and some um, negative belief systems that weren't consistent with me that I was carrying from other people. Mm -hmm. So I felt that I had to acknowledge the emotional and the spiritual aspects as well, which kind of led me to, to the more intuitive um, forms of, you know, addressing imbalances. Yeah. And like one of the things that I think is really cool about you, Joe, is that you're you're a skeptic before you're a believer. Do you Absolutely. want to talk a little bit more about <laughs> um, about that side of you, and 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 that you need things to be proven to you before you're going to buy into it? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, as again, I was studying civil engineering when I was first exposed. I first had my first bioresonance therapy session. Um, a friend had recommended me. I had chronic fatigue at the time. I had chronic diarrhea. Um, I would have migraine headaches for three days straight. Um, most mornings I would have a panic attack at 10.30 a.m. <laughs> so really? all of these things were happening and it was really distressing. Um, it affected my ability to, you know, be self-supporting and earn money. And I wanted to find answers. But, um, yeah, so I started having these bioresonance therapy sessions and in spite of my scepticism, I was starting to get better. So the evidence, from a scientific point of view, the evidence was proving my scepticism to be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, my health was improving, my friends and family were noticing, they were asking me what what I was doing, what I was doing different mm -hmm. um, because they could see this transformation happening for me, even though I wasn't mentally invested in it at the time. Um, yeah. And this, I've also done this in other things as well. I had a, actually had a naturopathic session and the naturopath introduced me to the, to numerology. And at the time, she spent more time talking about numerology than she did about the naturopathy. So I got myself a book and I did my own numerology and I did that for all of my family members, for my ex-husband, for my current husband, because I wanted to, to see if there was anything in it. And I figured I had to give it a chance. So, you know, I basically looked at the numerology for seven people. And um, I could not fault the accuracy of the numerology. So I think my scepticism and my need to prove if something is helpful for me or not, I actually think it's a really healthy thing. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we've got to yeah. question things. We don't want to just like buy into everything. Um, you know, and, and that's what I recommend to everybody listening to this too. I mean, we're going to talk about a lot of really, really valuable things today, but like try it on yourself and like you track yeah. the results and you tell us uh, what the results are. I mean, I've actually, a lot of things we're going to talk about today, I've actually implemented in my life and they've, yeah. they've had a huge impact. So that's why it's, I'm so excited about it. Um, I'm curious, uh, just real quickly here, the numerology, when you did this for like seven people, what was the numerology based off? Was it new, based off their name or, or their birth date or, or something like that? Like, how do you base the numerology off some one person? Well, there's, there's several different ways of looking at numerology and I p did it purely based on the date of birth. Okay. So, so it's, there wasn't any discrepancy between what name you choose. Do you choose your preferred name or your birth name? You know, for me, my preferred name is Joe, J-O. It's yeah. short and simple. It's easy. 
um, my full name Joanne has a hyphen, a capital A, which makes it, in from my perspective, it makes it complicated. So when you go just back to the, the nuts and bolts, the core numerology of the date of birth, um, it makes it very simple. And yeah. Seven people and like, you know, almost flawless like results. I think, I think that's yeah. fascinating. Um, it makes me want to learn a lot more about numerology. Um, I know you and I have had conversations in the past about mm -hmm. the concept that we as human beings uh, have the 100% responsibility over our health. And, you know, I think, I personally think this is a really freeing thing to know that I can control my health and that I can invoke positive health in my life. And I've done this and, and I've tried this on for size. Um, but there's some people out there that's probably like, that's too much of a thing to like handle. And it's like, it's too much of a responsibility to take on. So how would you just like basically explain to people the concept that we as human beings are, are responsible for our health? Oh, I, this is a really good question. Um, when I think of health, when you think of the potential within your own body um, and the components that contribute to who you are, there's obviously genetics and there's obviously predispos predisposition in the family genetic line coming from your mother and your father that can influence your own health. But our diet, the things we're exposed to, the toxins we're exposed to, the toxins we can eliminate from our lifestyle, all of these things contribute to who we are. And the, the ability of the human body to rejuvenate itself is phenomenal. So we can't underestimate the environment we choose to live in, what we're exposed to, the level of pollution, toxicity, whether it's air pollution or, or what we eat through our foods, through um, foods that have been affected by chemicals. There's, we have so many choices. And it is, I, I agree with you, it's freeing and empowering when you know that you can make healthy choices you can, and you can be impacting your own biology by the choices that you're making. And to some extent, you can override a lot of the genetics that come through because, you know, where people lived, if somebody grew up and worked in a coal mine, all of those factors influence the toxins they're exposed to, the quality of the food they eat. And we're in a place now, we, we have a lot of knowledge around foods and potential contamination and so on. And we have a lot of choice. So we can choose to eat clean, organic foods, free range meats if we choose to. Um, the, the choices are endless and we have this knowledge base that our predecessors didn't have. Yeah. And I think that's really fascinating too. Um, that the fact that we may have these genetical things, you know, something, there's a lineage in our family that something medically keep, has been happening in the past, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to happen to us because we can make lifestyle changes and we can, we can do things to, to change our biology. So that we're not as prone yeah. to it or maybe not even at all prone to it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Really exactly. That's, that's amazing. Um, that was, that was a, I want to talk real quick on a water study that was done. Um, you may be familiar with this, Joe. It's, uh, it was a water study performed by a Japanese scientist called um, Masuru Emoto. And in this study, he proved that human consciousness has an effect on the molecular structure of water. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to give a brief overview of what this study was. So um, there was a room, and in the middle of the room was a bunch of water bottles. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then there was a group of people standing around the water bottles. And then what they did is they all, they all stood there, and they all just like felt the emotion of love. They didn't say anything. They just felt the emotion of love, and, and they exuberated this emotion of love, and they did it for a certain period of time. And then what they did is they took the bottles of water from the middle of the room, they went and froze them, and then they ended up um, putting the frozen water under a microscope later on, and they looked at the molecular structure, and it was just this beautiful, symmetrical, geometric shapes that were in, in the water. 
And it was fascinating. So they're like, all right, they went back to the room and then they did the same thing. But this time, instead of feeling love, they felt hate and like anger mm -hmm. and negative emotions and all of these things, right? And they did it for another certain period of time. And then they ended up taking that, freezing it, checking that. But this time they get a very different result. They looked at it and all of the, the particles and molecular structure was chaotic. And it wasn't yeah. symmetrical and it was all over the place. So they did that with the emotion. Then they went back to the room and they did the same test with love and hate, but this time with verbal words. And uh, they were yelling out verbal words of love and compassion. Then they did another test with the, the, you know, anger and hate words. And they went and tested that water, same results. Then they went and then they wrote on the bottles, like compassionate words and loving words. Um, and then they, and they wrote on some other bottles, some, some hateful anger words, and then they went and froze that water, same result. And then the last test they did was they played music. They played uh, classical music, uh, beautiful, peaceful, classical music. And then they also played, I think it was like some death metal or really heavy metal or something like that. And again, they got the same results. All of the love was all, um, was all, you know, beautiful structures. Everything was really symmetrical. It was amazing to look at. All of the hate-based stuff, uh, whether it was verbal, emotion, written, or music, was all like chaotic and all over the place. And you know, the thing that I find really fascinating about that is, given that our body is seventy percent water, um, mm -hmm. that's like pretty freaking important. You know, if we're speaking these words and feeling these emotions yes. and 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 all of this. So, um, what are your thoughts on this? Yes. Yeah. It's. Um emotions and, and as you said the words that the verb verbiage that goes with the emotions is it's incredibly powerful i i actually believe that it is that is more powerful than some of the physically toxic elements you know like heavy metals and so on um it's it's been proven that that Kids who have grown up in non-supportive backgrounds, their immune systems are compromised from early time, very, very early in their lives, which is really tragic and traumatic because they're not getting that, that emotional support and the love that every child really needs to become a, a healthy contributing member of society. Um, it, and it, I think it's a, it's a tragic thing that, um, and that is a is a great example of of the impact of the words we use, the emotions we have. Um, I personally believe anger is a positive emotion, unless it is allowed to fester for an extended period of time. I believe there's a process that you need to be able to work through the anger so it becomes a productive force rather than a negative festering energy but in the short term i think um what we call negative emotions if if we're allowed to acknowledge them within ourselves and find out the reason why we're experiencing them then we can transform that and and process that and turn it into something that is um, can create momentum in our lives in a, in a positive way. It's something that we can change. And how would we do that? Like, what if, what if we're like a really angry person and we're like, you know, I, I get what you were saying before about like anger, because it's kind of like fear. It's useful, but if you're yeah. resonating in it and, um, yeah. and you're making all of your decisions based around fear, then it becomes not useful. Um, yeah. so, so I get that. But, but if someone's resonating too much or like, you know, spending too much time being angry, like, how can we change that? Well, one of the things that I've come to see about like anger in particular is that anger usually is present when somebody's boundaries have been crossed. Mm -hmm. So if you can, if you associate anger with, you know, I've, I have an angry outburst because somebody treated me in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Well, that gives me the opportunity to change how I interact with that person or how I interact with everybody. I can make changes and I can protect my energetic boundaries. I can make a stand. I can approach the person and say, you know, the way you treated me was unacceptable. Or if it's a, a long-term pattern with 
that person. It gives me the opportunity to decide where they fit in my life. If they're not willing to acknowledge my boundaries and my, my needs in a relationship, then you can do something about it. And it, it's almost a, um, a motivator for change. And it's similar with fear. When you're, when you're fearful, you kind of get stuck. You get frozen in a certain in a place. And sometimes one of the best things to do when you're fearful is to acknowledge what the fear is all about. And, you know, and there's, there's quotes flying around on Facebook and about how often you have to face your greatest fears to realize, you know, to overcome them. Um, sometimes you know, there's, there's things that we can actually do to shift the energy of the negative emotions such as fear and anger. Yeah. On the fear topic, I actually think that it's an opportunity for us to expand our comfort zone too, you know? Absolutely. Um, I mean, if, if we're scared right. because a lion's coming towards us and they're going to bite our head off, then we, we've got to pay attention to that. Um, but a lot of the other fears, they're just like, you know, kind of like things that we create in our head and we feel it in our gut and we can either choose to move forward, um, or we can be crippled by it. So yeah. I, I personally yeah. think the more that we, um, go with that, notice what it is, well, I'm not actually in danger. Let's rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I think that's an opportunity to grow. So yeah. on the, on another, the, if, sorry, go for it. if you don't mind me bringing up something else in relation to that, yeah. sometimes these emotions can also alert us to the fact that there's imbalances in our body okay. because, you know, and back to tr traditional Chinese medicine, um, there's a five element theory that groups different um, organs in the body into, into five, there's five groups. There's wood, there's water, there's metal, there's fire and there's earth. Mm -hmm. Now the wood element organs um, include the liver and the gallbladder. Okay. Traditional Chinese medicine says anger sits in the liver. So if you have a tendency to be angry a lot, what that is telling you is that there's an imbalance in your liver, that your liver is under load, it's stressed, it needs some support. So sometimes it's physical, physical, you can get physical support and it's in like an early sign of potential disease as well. When you, when you repeatedly experience these emotions, you know, you might have what is known as a liver fluke, which is a parasite that lives in the liver and it can contribute to these angry emotions. You might have, you know, you might have a high level of heavy metals. So there's a lot of, there's a, sometimes emotions can be little like neon signs, you know, like a red light, a green light, a yellow light saying, Hey, there's something wrong here. And, you know, I need some help. You know, your liver's kind of screaming out for some help. So and the same with fear. Yeah, fear is, tends to be related to the kidneys and the bladder. Really? So if you're constantly in a state of fear, you may have an issue with your kidneys and bladder. Hmm. Okay, that's really interesting. So like, so mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're actually talking with somebody and you're looking to solve one of their problems that they have with their health, you'd be looking at it from like the, the physical side um, you, you could also be looking at it from a dietary side and then you're looking at it from a spiritual and emotional side. There's like yeah. a lot of different like ways that we could approach it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's amazing. And yeah. And it's, it's, I find it really, again, empowering that you can be looking at things from different perspective and you can be providing people support from different perspectives. Um, and Hey, knowledge is power. When you, when you recognize that, um, you can do something about it. You're in a position, you have more a power to make changes in your life that you wouldn't otherwise have. Yeah, that's awesome. Because you might be doing something about your health, but then like if you've got an underlying problem with your internal organs and not even addressing them, wow, that's, that's really powerful. I, I didn't know that our emotions were tied to our internal organs. That's fascinating. Yeah. One thing that I also um, see, that it's, it's something that we can't necessarily see in our body and that's pH levels. So, mm -hmm. you know, for people listening, just like a fish tank, 
all of you know, when you're a kid, you had a fish tank, you had to check the pH levels. Um, and on one end of the scale is acidity, on the other end there's alkalinity and you've got to find that right balance so the fish can survive. Because if it's too acidic, they're going to die. And if it's too mm -hmm. alkaline, they're going to die and the fish tank's going to be covered in um, algae. And um, so we have to find that. And, and the fact that we have uh, our body is 70% water, mm -hmm. I believe that pH plays a big role. Um, yes. in, our, in our health. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about uh, pH and, and our health and, and how that affects us? Yeah, yeah, that's, it's a fascinating topic, pH. Um, and like you've just given a really good example of, of how, it, you know, it, how it works in a um, restricted ecosystem such as a fish tank because, you know, there's, there's not a lot of outside well there is no in outside interaction based on the glass the glass walls but in the human body there's um one thing i found fascinating when i first started recognizing um the importance of the acid alkaline balance in the human body is that the foods that we view as being the most indulgent the ones that we're treating ourselves or you know oh i've had a bad day the, the foods that we tend to be drawn to are more the, the like the party foods, the, mm -hmm. the I'm giving yourself a treat. Mm -hmm. They tend to be high in sugar. Mm -hmm. They're your, your carbohydrates, like grain-based products, your baked goods, your pastries, um, your things like beer and peanuts, um, potato chips, all of the things that you tend to gravitate towards when you're, okay, I'm relaxed. I've had a mm -hmm. big hard week. So you get stuck into, you have a beer, you have a packet of chips or crisps as I think you'd call them in the States or French fries. Mm -hmm. um, all of these foods are highly acidic. So this, our culture almost puts acidic, well, yeah, a lot of the culture puts the acidic foods in this category that they're they're special and they're they're indulgent and they're ways that we good. can yeah but my experience is those foods they're the foods that i need to avoid personally mm -hmm. i do not cope well on a high carb diet mm -hmm. i prefer to be grain free because your grains are higher in in acid but i just don't feel good when i eat that stuff I'm way better having, you know, fruits and veggies and, you know, um, you know, I do have some animal protein, but way less than I used to because your proteins, even your dairy products tend to be higher in, in, on the acid scale. So your green veggies are more alkalizing and they balance the diet. So when I was doing research on this originally, when I first found out about it, I, I came across information that was saying that for, to eliminate one part of acidity, um, you have to throw a couple of parts of alkalinity at it. And I can't remember if it was like two or four parts. Um, so really, to eliminate acidity, we have to really, really crank up on alkalinity. Yeah. I want to talk yeah. about that in a minute. But before we do, what, like, what happens if we have a really acidic diet? And we have a really acidic pH. Um, what negative effects could that have in our body? Like, what would that mean for us? It, it's phenomenal the the effects that, that that has. You know, things like your yeast infections. Um, in Australia, we we tend to talk about candida mm -hmm. as being um, your molds and your fungi tend to live in a highly acidic environment. Um, you've also got your intestinal bacteria like your Helicobacter pylori, which produces ulcers. It also lives in a highly acidic environment and it can often work really closely with your candidas and your, your molds that, you know, that affect your function. Things like um, candida thrush. Candida like, like thick, uh, it's like thickened blood, isn't it? Or like particles in the blood? No, candida is a type of... It's, it's a type of mold okay. and um, when you tend to be craving a lot of sugars and sweet sweets, mm -hmm. um, lollies, your sugars, your high carbs, then it's highly likely you have candida in your body already. Yeah. So okay. it's already 
living in an acidic environment Mm -hmm. and you're craving more of that because it's not actually you who's craving it. It's the mold that's craving. So it's like like, tapeworm where you're going to like feed the tapeworm. Yeah, pretty much. So it's, (laughs) it is. And that's what is interesting about microbes is a lot of microbes is that they can have a, a parasitic effect, but they can also, they can also change our behavior. Um, when you have candida, you, you tend to be quite moody. <laughs> mm-hmm. You can be quite erratic and moody. But when you think about it, you've got these sugar spikes happening. You get your sugar hit, you feel good for 10, 15 minutes, and then you come down off that and have this depressive low. So you're on this, mm. you're, it's a very um, erratic mood cycle that it creates. Yeah, and like when I was doing research on on you know acidity, especially it was it was kind of mind boggling because it just seemed as a general statement, it seemed like if you have a highly acidic pH in your body, it, it's basically the environment that is the perfect environment for disease and absolutely and, and yeah. illness and yeah. and all inflammation the things, yeah and all the things that we don't want, and so then it seemed really obvious to me that um, if we crank up on alkalinity, we're actually eliminating yeah. lots of our acidity. And if we're yeah. in that right pH, and we, from my research at least, and I want you to expand on this, but from my research, I found that in the perfect alkaline diet um, and, and the pH in our body, if it's correct, then it, it's kind of hard for disease and illness to survive. It's like, it's almost the wrong environment yeah. for it. Exactly. Yeah, totally. And like what I was saying before about the Helicobacter pylori and the Candida, they tend to live in more acidic environments. Um, You were talking earlier about so many parts of alkaline to balance out so many parts of acidity. The interesting thing about the pH scale is, um, I... I'm not sure if, I believe it's a logarithmic scale, which means it's a curve. So it's not a direct straight line relationship. Okay. So, and, and you were talking about the parts and and balancing it. So each pH level is about a hundred times higher than, it's a little bit difficult to explain, but again, it's not a straight line relationship. So, so so when you were talking... So what you're saying is like the more, the more alkalinity we have, like the, the, the more effect, it's like a compounding effect on taking. Exactly. Yeah. Scale. Okay. And for example, if you were to have a glass of Coke, like one cup of Coke, mm-hmm. Coca-Cola, yeah. it would take 30 glasses of alkaline water to counteract the alkal the acidity of the coke to bring you back to a ph of seven which is neutral wow so if we're like if we've got like a high um soft drink or, or soda yes. diets if we're, if we're smashing slurpees at 7-eleven um yes. if we're drinking like tons of coffee and things like that then yes. we've got a lot of work to do to to basically to take bring away it the back negative effects that's that's, that's really right boggling. That's wow. right. And as you said, it tends to be compounding and you have, you're dealing with inflammation and disease. There's all sorts of intestinal issues that are caused by, by you know, an, an acidic environment. You can have skin conditions. It affects your whole body. So it affects. What do we do? So what do we do? Like, how do, like what, what's alkaline foods? What can someone do if they want to crank up on alkalinity? What do they eat? Well, your fruits and your veggies. Classic good old fruits and veggies. Um, the greens are, are particularly good. Mm-hmm. Your greens and the colors say a lot. If you, if you can have a meal and you're eating, you're eating vegetables that represent that all the different colors, you know, you can have the cauliflower. Yep. Potatoes are highly acidic. I personally am not a fan of potatoes because of the, okay. the, the um, glu- glycemic index of them. Okay. They're, yeah. they're too, too carby, too high mm-hmm. carb for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and they break down too quickly. Mm-hmm. So um, like your cauliflower is white. <laughs> yeah. Then you've got your greens and you've got so many, you've got zucchini, you've got spinach, you've got 
you know, even your peas and beans, they're legumes. Technically, they're more difficult to break down. But I have found when you reduce the high carb, starchy products, your body doesn't have a, have as much trouble breaking down the legumes. Okay. And then you've got, you know, you've got your squashes and, and other veggies as well. You know, like your carrots. You've got all those beautiful colours you can have on on your plate and it gives you an idea of the um, nutrients that they provide, the different, the colour groupings so as it's, well. it's pretty much back to basics. It's just like, it's the same yeah. old thing that we've been hearing, but, but it's explained in a different, from a different way. Um, and it's something that most people aren't aware of, pH levels in the body. I actually have pH test strips. Um, this is what I use here, these pH That's test great. strips. And That's you can great. get these at your local pharmacy. And I actually just get this and I'll, I'll rip off about an inch of it. And then you take mm -hmm. it to the restroom and you pee and then you see what color it goes. And uh, yeah. as you can see, one end there is acidic and one end there is uh, alcohol or more alkaline. And you'll know That's where you're right. at. And it allows me to know where I'm at. And it's interesting if I, if I do breathing exercises or if I just had a green juice, um, yeah. I am like so high on the alkaline scale. It's, it's awesome. Yes. And, uh, do you, do you also, do you also test your saliva? I have not done that. No. Okay. Cause, um, that's a good reading to do first thing in the morning as well. Check really? your saliva levels after you've been asleep all night. Okay. So, that's interesting. Yeah. Is, is there the possibility of a little bit of additional acidity at nighttime? Yes. In our mouth? Yeah. It's likely to be more acidic, but it also gives you a bit of an idea of, of what's going on as well. So yeah, okay. consider that too. I've always wondered, I don't know if you can shed any light on this, but I've always wondered like in the morning, should I, should I go and brush my teeth or should I go straight for like a big thing of water and, and, and chug a bunch of water? Do I want to wash all of that stuff down in my mouth and into my gut or, or should I brush my teeth? Well, if your body's detoxing well and it's based on your diet, I would be saying it is, you know, things like having your regular bowel motions. It means you're not, you're not kind of, you don't have an accumulation of um, waste that hasn't been removed mm -hmm. regularly. Okay. Uh, I don't see a problem with you having a big drink of water. Okay. I think that's a really good starting place actually. Okay. So you're not worried about like any of the bacteria or anything that we've, we've stored in our mouth overnight. We can have a, glass of water and massively dilute it and it's probably not a big problem well when you say that you bring up something um another issue um that is related to your mouth and your teeth okay if you have bacteria in your teeth and we were talking earlier about the different the five element groupings within traditional chinese medicine well, each of your teeth aligns with one of those different groupings. Okay. So, if, for example, your wisdom teeth are what we call fire element, mm -hmm. which relates to your heart circulation, small intestines, and your hormones. Really? So, um, if you have all your wisdom teeth removed, mm -hmm. then when you're chewing, those organ systems aren't being stimulated by the, the chewing in the body. And when you think purely from the point of view of your hormones, the triple warmer meridian that's represented by, in the fire element by your wisdom teeth, mm -hmm. no wonder we have so many um, hormonal issues in the Western world, because one of the first things we do is we rip out our wisdom teeth. We pull them out, get rid of them. Um, and there's, there's going to be impacts on the body. But you were talking about bacteria in relation to the teeth. Mm -hmm. So um, when there's any kind of bacterial infection in the mouth, it can have flow-on effects to other parts of the body as well, depending on which teeth really? they're, okay. they're within. So like your four front teeth, your four top teeth and bottom teeth, mm -hmm. they're water element, which relate to your kidneys and bladder. Okay. So regardless of if you're actually like swallowing water from bacteria in your mouth, if you've got some in your teeth, you could, you could feel those effects in your organs. So going back to where you were actually saying would we take our wisdom teeth out, is there anything that we can do that would sort of counteract the off um, hormonal balance or, or does, our, does our body end up getting used to it and adjusting? 
Well, I, I think um, hormones is a really big issue, hormonal imbalances in, in society. There are other ways of supporting supporting our hormones and you know just part of the problem part of the issue is just even knowing it's a an issue to begin with Mm -hmm. there are there are herbal supplements that we can take that are really supportive of our hormonal systems like for women particularly there's um phytex agnus castus is Mm -hmm. the latin name it's also called chase tree it's it's a herb Yeah. yeah it's a herb that really is helpful for a lot of women and it's you know it's been used by herbalists for for such a long time so there's there's different herbal supplements that we can take that can help counteract okay. those awesome. negative effects yeah so if we have had our, our wisdom teeth out we are feeling something off hormonally we can we can sort of veer off and try some herbs and, and see how that makes an effect that's, yeah that's really cool yeah i like that mm-hmm. One, one thing that I find really fascinating, and I find this fascinating for a whole variety of reasons, but it's, it's the fact, it's the concept of the spectrum of light. And what humans can see on the spectrum of light is basically the rainbow of colors. And um, to explain this, I would say that let's just say we're looking at a ruler and a ruler is uh, 30 centimeters long or it's 12 inches long. And... Um, the, the spectrum of light that human beings can actually see is around about like um, a quarter of an inch or, or five millimeters. It's tiny compared to the rest of the ruler. And then on, yeah. the, on the rest of the spectrum, there's gamma rays, X rays, ultraviolet rays, infrared rays. There's radar, there's FM wavelengths, there's TV wavelengths, there's shortwave and there's AM. And so there's all mm-hmm. these, like there's this whole soup of um, frequencies and, and spectrum of light that we as humans can't see, but they're still around and they still like massively affect us. And um, I mean, I think it's really important yeah. that we know about this. What do you think about all of this? Oh, for sure. For sure. And that is one of the, I think it's one of the biggest potential um, threats. The Some of the frequencies that are harmful because we can't see them, we can be a little bit oblivious and therefore we, we're not aware of the risks involved. So um, in terms of, and, and there's, yes, we have the beautiful colors of the rainbow and there are actual therapies, there are modalities that are based on providing um, support for the human body based on introducing individual colors mm. to certain parts of the body, it's color therapies, the uh, color spectrum therapy, there's, a, there's a, a number of them that are recognized and certified um, that, that do help the body. Just even on that scale, just even on the color scale, we're affected by yeah. it, let alone on the other ends of the spectrum. I mean, I know one of these things that human can't physically see is radiation. Yes. Um, yes. Can you talk about what, um, like how this, like what things in our life, in our daily life, emit radiation that affect us yeah yeah well your mobile phones are probably the biggest ones because we carry them around there we can communicate i could call you from my mobile phone and you're you know you're within you're in the united states Mm -hmm. so we've we've got this amazing connection provided by wi-fi now um 5g is really kicking in but there are the the research is showing that 5g the energy produced from the the frequency band that is utilized for 5g is pretty harmful especially from a neurological point of view in terms of even child development the the development of children's brains can be set back based on um, and negatively affected based on exposure to the 5g. Wow. Because like the, the connection's really awesome, but there's these, these, these radiation yeah. waves that are happening around it. So, so the yeah. kids that I see out there, like scrolling through the iPads and, and everything like that, like that, that really, I didn't know that it had negative effects on, 
the development yeah. of children's brains. That's, that's yeah. Cool. And that's probably one of the biggest ones. There's, we're also exposed to radiation through computers, um, laptops, um, televisions, even, even, um, even like a hairdryer and, you know, a straightener, hair straightener, those things. But one of the big, most important things to consider when you're looking at radiation is the length of time you're exposed to it and how close you are to it. So with my mobile phone, I can talk to you and I can hold it up to my ear, which I don't tend to do. I tend to hold it. I tend to hold it and have it on speakerphone. Mm -hmm. That's how I, that's how I make all of my phone calls um, now, pretty much regardless of who I'm talking to. So with one of the things to consider with your five, five G and your other Wi-Fi, four, three G, four G, five G, depending on where you live mm -hmm. is um, the biggest consideration I find that I believe is probably paramount is that if you can turn it off at nighttime when you're sleeping, it allows your body time to rejuvenate and replenish. And you don't have that additional stress on your body while you're sleeping. So when you say turn it off, what do you mean? Like literally like turn your phone off or, or is there like a mode on our phone that reduces the amount of radiation or like what, what, what does like airplane mode do? Does that do anything or? Airplane, airplane mode prevents um, messages coming back and forth. I believe it shuts down your texting, texting function as well. Okay. Um, but so you, yeah, at nighttime, it's a good idea to, to put your phone on flight mode. So you're not actually, your phone isn't receiving or sending signals. So if you have your phone on your bedside table next to the bed, it, it easily could be a few feet from your head mm. and so when it's receiving and sending signals through the night that's interrupting potentially interrupting your sleep patterns mm. um it's not allowing your body to replenish it's not allowing your, your the cells of your body to rest and recharge which is is what our sleep time is for and so a lot of us are going to use our phones. A lot of us, like our, our life mm. revolves around phones. So um, the concept of not using a phone would just seem like almost impossible for, for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, you're saying if we are using it, use it, like try and keep it away from us a little bit. Um, yeah. Use the speaker phone or use like the, the plug-in earbuds if we can. And yeah. if we weren't going to turn it off at night, let's say that we had to have our phone because – um, that we need to be there for emergency calls and stuff like that. How far away do you think it would be comfortable, a, a safe, comfortable distance is if we, uh, do, we have, do we leave it at the other end of the room? Do we have to leave it in the kitchen? Like, what would you say at my time? Um, I always put my phone on flight mode mm -hmm. and it's, it's on silent at nighttime um, because our spleen tends to be the most affected organ that an organ system in the body, which can lead us to be overthinking. If we're always on, we can't relax. If we're always mentally um, switched on, we can't sleep properly. We overthink. We, we tend to be obsessive in our thinking. OCD, those kind of tendencies are related to an overactive spleen. So when you ask about... Uh, I must admit, I have my phone in the bedroom, the other end of the bedroom when I'm sleeping, but it is on flight mode and it is on, well, it's on silent, which if it's on flight mode, I'm not going to receive anything anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, we want to keep just, it far away though, right? If, yeah, but ultimately, room, yeah, ultimately it goes back to the, the two principles. Mm -hmm. You've got to consider the proximity, how close you are to the radiation source and the length of time that you're exposed to the radiation. So if you can limit those things, you know, you don't need 5G on while you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. So you, you can turn it off. And we sometimes our health requires that we make lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, totally. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, I've made them myself. I mean, I've made a lot of changes uh, myself. My wife and I started researching this. Actually, I saw a, it was a presentation. You can find it on YouTube. There was an American lady who did a ton of research on the impact of cell phones. And she went to um, Melbourne, I think it was Melbourne, the University of Melbourne. She gave a speech back in 2015 about the effects and studies of of cell phones and what it's like for a woman to hold it in a pocket near her breast and a guy yeah. um, to, to hold it um, down near his uh, reproductive organs and, and all of this yes. sort of stuff and like kids holding him. And it was like really fascinating study. But one of the things about it was that I didn't know that um, we, we get radiation from cell phones, just like we get radiation from um, microwaves but they're just yeah. like on a bit of a different, I think it's a different pulse or a different frequency or something like it's that. It's a different frequency, yeah. So like it's obvious, your cell phones are bad for us. Um, we, we need to be conscious of that with our health because they obviously have an impact on our health. What about microwaves? Absolutely. Microwaves actually change the chemical structure of your food. So um, I'm not a fan of microwaves at all and I encourage all of my clients to use other forms of heating for their for their foods um yeah it's it's challenging and and some people can be a bit reluctant but um when people start seeing noticeable results in their health and when you relate it to something like fertility i have you know i work with young couples who are trying to fall pregnant and i say hey if if your husband's a tradie a tradesman in australia yeah and he's carrying his mobile phone in his pocket, can he carry it somewhere else? You know, can he carry it in a vest rather yeah. than having it in direct contact with his body? Because uh, the radiation can, can reduce your fertility. Yeah, that's, that's mind boggling. On the topic of microwaves, um, my wife and I just, once we found out the information about it, we were just like, oh, right, we can't use a microwave. And in the beginning, yeah. it was like, man, like I like heat just about everything in the microwave. And yeah. it was like, what am I going to do? And so we went out and we bought a toaster oven. And it's a toaster oven is around about the same size, a little bit smaller than a microwave. And you can do everything that you can do with a microwave. But instead of it taking yeah. five minutes, it takes 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, and a little yeah. bit of more time into it. So you've got, kind of got to plan a little bit ahead. Um, That's right. But I think everything tastes better. It tastes amazing. You can taste it. I totally just, agree. Like if you microwave something, it's kind of just depleted and steamy and kind yeah. of a weird taste. Well, and that's and just consider too what I said about the chemical structure of the food is changed by a microwave. So it makes sense that it's going to taste different because it's it is different yeah. as a result of the waves, the the microwaves that it's been the food's been exposed to. Yeah, that's mind boggling. Mm -hmm. So. Another, th another thing, and this is this kind of like segues into this, is another thing that we can't really see is the frequency in our food. Um, so obviously, I'm, I'm assuming that the radiation from the microwave is changing the frequency of the food. Um, you and I have talked before about inside frequencies and outside frequencies. What are outside and inside frequencies? Do you mean inside the body and outside of the body? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um... Okay, this is, there was a, a really brilliant scientist, American scientist from the 1920s, and he did several, he had a research project and he discovered that each of us, each of us, well, he was working more directly with viruses and bacteria at the time. So he discovered that each virus and each bacteria has its own signature wave pattern. So it has a frequency that it is activated at and it also has a frequency where it can be killed at. Mm -hmm. So, um, and since the 1920s, other researchers and scientists and um, naturopaths and so on have discovered that all of, all of the microbes, the parasites, bacteria, molds, um, viruses mm -hmm. they each of them has this frequency range where they can be activated or deactivated and it's the same with with your foods for example like wheat if you have organic wheat mm -hmm. it's going to have a specific signature wave pattern okay 
if you have wheat that has been grown in, I think in the States, glyphosate's a really big one, a big one of the pesticides and insecticides used. It's the wheat is, if it's grown with, with, and with a specific pesticide, it's going to have a very different signature pattern to the organic wheat because there's another, um, there's another factor that's been introduced into the wheat that has changed it. It's, it's so it different. It the frequency and it changes. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and so people can have no reaction to your organic wheat but they can be highly reactive to you, to your wheat that includes the component of your pesticides and insecticides. And that could be directly relating to the health in their body because it's either, it's either uh, promoting uh, poor exactly. health uh, exactly. or it's promoting good health, depending on you know, what it is and what frequency it is and everything like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm probably, I'm probably going off topic a bit here, but that I think is one very big explanation for why we have an increased rate of gluten intolerance in the Western world mm -hmm. because of the introduction of the chemicals into wow. the equation. So it actually affects the signature wave pattern of the wheat because of the introduction of the, the chemicals. So we want to have the good, we want to have the good high frequency foods um, because that's good for our body. And I want to talk about that in a minute. But you also just talked about the difference between non-organic and organic. And I know that some people out there they still haven't um, that they're not sold on the organic concept, or maybe they don't want to spend the money to buy organic products because it costs a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You had taught me about the dirty dozen and the clean fifteen. What what do you want to talk about? What these two different food groups are? Yes, um, there's, there's a, an organization in the States called the Environmental Working Group. And every year they provide, they do, they run studies, they do testing on specific foods. Um, and they, oh, I was really, my mind was boggled by one particular study a few years ago. And it showed, I think it showed that strawberries are highly susceptible to your pesticide load. And they're more likely retain, to retain it than some other fruits and veggies. And this one of the the recent one of the scientific studies showed that one strawberry had they could detect twelve different types of chemicals within that one strawberry, which I found to be pretty phenomenal. So every every year they do these the, the testing in the studies and they show the foods that um, you know the dirty dozen refers to the fruits and vegetables that have that have been proven to have a high pesticide load and to retain high levels of pesticides. So, so yeah, the, you're talking about the non non organic uh, types of food. Uh, absolutely. They, they don't have the yeah. organic label, they're not organic and they're really soaking up, they just really soak up like pesticides and, and herbicides and all that kind of stuff, right? So Exactly. Yeah. So, so this dirty dozen if we are going to just, if we're not going to have organic foods and we're going to stay away from them, these are the ones that we've got to be careful of because they're just jam packed with the highest concentration of, of all of these pesticides and everything like that. Right? Exactly. And your berries are super susceptible because they don't, they're, they're kind of unprotected. They're just, mm -hmm. so they tend okay. to soak it in, soak it in more easily. And then at the other end of the spectrum is the clean 15, which are the fruits and veggies that are less susceptible to the pesticide load. Yeah. So um, just, before, just before we talk about those, I've actually pulled the list of the dirty dozen up in front of me here. And I'm just going to read it out. Um, so we've got strawberries, spinach, kale, nectarines, apples, grapes, peaches, cherries, pears, tomatoes, celery, and potatoes. And this is just the Dirty Dozen. Um, and I'm going to share the link to the Dirty Dozen and the, and the Clean 15 for all of you listeners. You'll see it in the show notes. Um, and then when you actually like click on the link, you can click on get the full list. And there's around about mm -hmm. 47 or 48 of these fruits and vegetables that, uh, that are more highly susceptible. So I just wanted to like point that out. Sorry, you were going to talk about the Clean 15. 
Oh yeah, yeah, the clean 15 are the fruits and veggies that are less susceptible to the pesticide load. So I know a lot of people who don't, um, don't choose to eat purely organic foods. Um, sometimes there are financial um, considerations because you know your organic food is going to cost more so this is a really good way of um, a rational scientifically proven way of approaching the foods that you do choose to eat that are organic as opposed to the food you don't it helps you make the decision you know the research has been done and it's it's an easy easy choice as to which so Which if we're only going to buy ones? a few organic products, we're going to go with the dirty dozen. So with we'll, we'll the dirty dozen, we're going to get organic versions of those because they're exactly. otherwise high in pesticides. But if we, if yeah. we weren't going to um, get anything organic, then the ones that are most safe would be the clean 15. Yes. And yeah. I've got that list in front of me right here. Excellent. And, um, <laughs> and that one's avocados, um, sweet corn, pineapple, onions, papaya, sweet peas that have been frozen, eggplants, asparagus, cauliflower, cantaloupe, um, or rock melon is also um, called, uh, broccoli, mushrooms, cabbage, honeydew melon, and kiwi fruit. And there's a little note here that says, if you're getting sweet corn or papaya in the US, um, a lot of it's made from genetically modified seeds, so that's another thing to take into consideration, but that doesn't really concern people in other areas of the, of the planet. So, so you're saying that these vegetables and fruits, we can be, they're relatively safe and they're safer than, yeah. than other ones anyway. Yeah, yeah. I would like to, to put a, a flag on the corn as well because corn can be genetically modified. There's a bit of a history with corn in that respect. So that's a bit of a disclaimer on the corn as well. Yeah. Yeah, we, well, that's, that's one that we always, uh, I mean, we always buy organically anyway, but sometimes yeah. if you go to a restaurant, you can't guarantee that's it's right. going to be organic. So if, we, mm -hmm. if it's born at a restaurant and it's not an organic-based restaurant, we just give it a miss. Um, yeah. We've actually yeah. um, done a bit of research on that one ourselves, and it's pretty yeah. nasty. Um, and it's, so, oh, that's also a disclaim. Um, another comment I'd like to make too on that is that if you're eating really cleanly at home, um, you know, it's, it's obviously, obviously it's a personal choice, but, um, it's a bit of a balance too that, you know, you have to factor in that potentially you are going to be eating foods that have some pesticide load or that, you know, when you're eating at a restaurant or yeah. getting takeaway, for example. So, yeah. And that's the funny thing, you know, I mean, Everyone's got their own opinion on, on what the lockdown experience has been like with COVID and everything like that. But I've never had so many home cooked meals. Mm -hmm, I feel mm -hmm. amazing. I feel so good. Yeah. And like, yeah. uh, I was looking at myself the other day in the shower and I'm like, man, I've lost a little bit of like body fat from probably just from the foods that I was eating when I eat out. Um, yeah. so I, I think it's, yeah. there's some, definitely some benefits from it. Um, so what high frequency foods, what high, what are high frequency foods, which should we be leaning towards? Well, in, again, Western world, we're really bad at our fruits and veggies and they're the ones that contain the nutrients. Um, I'm, I personally do eat, I eat, um, I eat meat. I know some people don't, mm -hmm. but I eat, I, I think I mentioned this earlier, I eat way less of it than I used to. And I'm leaning more towards um, vegetable proteins as well yeah. from, you know, pea protein is a very good source of um vegetable protein mm -hmm. um use that a lot in my smoothies and you've also got you you know your quinoa your um alternate grain sources that you know that are well they're not always grains either grains and seeds um and your nuts are very high in in protein mm -hmm. as well and your good fats so so we're um, kind of sticking towards veggies again. It's, it's going back to like, you know, leafy greens and um, I think raw almonds are really high. I, wheatgrass shots pretty high and high frequency. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, your almonds too, they're, they're alkaline. But then I think a lot, they're high. Out of all of the nuts, your, your almonds are the most alkaline. 
So they're they're really good as a a snack. Yeah. It's really cool. And um, I think another good rule of thumb when I was doing my research on high frequency foods is that the less you mess with it, the, the more that it's closer to its original form when it was grown on a plant, um, the better it is. So like, you know, if you're, you, you could have a high frequency food, but then you freeze it and then you microwave it and then you like, you cook it and whatever. Yes. It's, it's losing yeah. frequency. So, and I think that's one that's of the right. theories behind why some people have a, a raw food diet or like to, to juice or have cold pressed juices, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, traditional Chinese medicine tends to lean towards having foods that is more your own body temperature. So heating it to, to a level where your body doesn't have to work as hard to digest it. So that's a bit of an alternate um, concept. I know that works for me better than a purely raw food diet. Um, Things like your slow cooked meals, your, um, you know, those lovely soups that you can make and you can, they, they take time to really for all of the, the nutrition, the flavors to blend and mix and, yeah. and they're just so tasty and comforting. And, yeah. you know, those kind of meals are really good as well. Yeah. And those kinds of meals taste better the next day or like the, the day after. Oh, they do. Exactly. Like, more of that flavor. <laughs> Leftovers. So, so um, you talk about microorganisms and toxins. And I think this is a pretty important topic because, and we're kind of talking about like heavy metals and and chemicals and and their interactions. And I've heard a lot of people talk about um, the effects that uh, some certain types of vaccinations have had on their kids with certain types of heavy metals in there. Um, There's been a lot of cases of autism around that. Um, We're also now aware that we've got to be careful how much seafood we eat because there's Mm -hmm. mercury levels in our seafood. And I believe even Tony Robbins has mercury poisoning and he's sort of dealing with that. And also as an ex-welder, I know that breathing in the fumes from aluminum and stainless steel had a really serious negative health effect. So what's the deal with heavy metals in our body? (sighs) Heavy metals are hard to get away from because we breathe them in in the environment um and as you said with the with your um food sources from the sea your fish and so on it mercury tends to accumulate in the in the chain the ecosystem chain so the phytoplankton might um be eating from the bottom of the ocean and and it's and part of its food source is includes mercury so then the next little fish up that eats the the phytoplankton it's it each little bit of mercury that these little fish have kind of gets carried on into the next fish up really? so Is it's a bite science? it's an accumulation Is that the science behind why they say, hey, like the ones with the highest mercury content are the big fish, like swordfish and and stuff? Absolutely, because they've eaten all the little fish. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Didn't know that. Okay. So there are so many sources of mercury in our environment. And probably the biggest one is for those of us who have had or still have mercury or amalgam fillings, Mm -hmm. we're constantly exposed to the, that heavy metal within our mouth and it can impact on our brain function our learning capabilities it it can the there are certain organs that the mercury tends to sit in and it's it can be really difficult to detox the you, mercury you're from actually different organs. saying on those on mercury fillings that each time we like bite and, and and take a bite it's actually releasing toxins into our body and we yeah. inhale that right so that's right so each time you off, chew yeah you're creating mercury vapor mercury in your mouth vapor. wow so like first off <clears throat> if anybody has mercury fillings get rid of it right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um <clears throat> what, what, what else can we do like um we know what some of the symptoms are to heavy metals and they're really really not good they're like really really catastrophic symptoms we are exposed to it obviously we don't want to be exposed to it um I'm going to try and limit that. But if we are, what can we do if we're affected by heavy metals? Is there any practices that we can follow or any things that we can do? Um, there, there are. Th- okay. One thing that's really interesting, and this is, this is 
really appeals to my engineering mind. Um, things like supplements like your zeolite, mm -hmm. um, bentonite clay zeolite. Some people might be more familiar with your bentonite. They have this, this structure. Okay. And think when you think positively charged, negatively charged, mm -hmm. your, your clays, your zeolite is a form of clay. Mm -hmm. It's, and it's negatively charged. Mm -hmm. Your metals are all positively charged. So if you introduce zeolite in, and zeolite has this like matrix kind of form where it's negatively charged, you introduce it into the body, you take the supplement every day. And the, anything that's positively charged is going to be attracted to that. Mm -hmm. The clever thing about zeolite is it attracts the metal and encapsulates it within the zeolite structure. And then you, you pass it through your body like any other waste product. But in the process, you're cleansing your body of the metals at the same time. Interesting. So, and and that's just using natural. Uh, yeah, it's using in a powder form. Okay. Um, the, it, and one thing I find really interesting is, you know, I'm now living in a more agricultural community mm -hmm. and there's, you know, cattle and, and so on. And the supplements that we often give to the animals are the supplements that we need ourselves. And it's often mm -hmm. in these communities that it, you know, they recognize the benefits for the animals. And um, some of these supplements have been developed for, you know, the rural communities. And then they've seen flow on effects for human, it's humans and they've started in introducing these same supplements into for as with a human dosage as opposed to a for that for the animals interesting um, yeah. i know that i have a friend whose uh, child had i can't remember what vaccination it was but they they noticed that after the vaccination his attitude had changed and then he um he's like really really late to speak um i think he's uh three, four years old right now, and I don't believe he's speaking yet. He's heavily autistic, and they've gone out and they've um, – it may be a similar concept to these supplements that you're talking about because uh, they were guided to give their child clay baths. Um, so yeah. Then it brings out the negative ions, and, and well, yes. negative ions are in there, and it neutralizes and whatnot. On a, on a different note, I had done um, some research on a thing called earthing, where we basically yes. take our shoes off – and we go yes. out and we, we just walk on the earth. And the yes. whole concept about this uh, documentary that I actually saw about earthing was that the negative ions in the ground, yes. um, and, and it's good for our health, but I, I, I kind of tied the two together. Do they tie together? Is this, would this also be something that would be good for us? Or is it a um, different topic? I think it's a different topic. And, but you're talking positive, negative ions. And I'm so pleased you brought this up because this ties in really beautifully with the radiation mm -hmm. as well. Um, because radiation, when you think about in nature, there is that natural um, layer of negative ions on the surface of the earth. So when, when you go for a bushwalk or you go hiking and you're, you've got all the trees and the green around you or you go to the beach, and the beach is particularly interesting because you have the waves pounding and all of this beautiful mineral energy as well. And um, you're also, at the same time, you're exposed to this layer of negative electrons on the surface of the earth. That counteracts your radiation sources. Um, really? So really? Exp exposure to nature and earthing counteracts the radiation sources because the radiation sources generate more positive ions. Mm -hmm. So one of the best things you can do to counteract the negative effects of radiation is to be in nature, to walk barefoot on the ground, you know, especially, you know, if you're able to, to have that direct contact with the earth. And there are earthing products that you can buy as well, because one of the I think sometimes we can, we're supposed to be civilized and intelligent, but sometimes we've created an environment where we've actually insulated ourselves and isolated ourselves from the benefits of the earth. And 
that this is one way we've done it. We insulate our houses so we don't have contact with the earth. Um, we insulate the soles of our shoes so we can't feel the benefits of that positive layer of electrons. Kind of um, like a pro and a con. We get, the, we get the benefit of being able to protect our feet, then we're losing out on something natural that uh, yeah. walking barefoot. I, I yeah, that sustains seen. us. Yeah. I, I didn't know that that was directly related to being beneficial for exposure to radiation. Um, I do it. I enjoy it. I also remember going down to the Amaz uh, the jungle in the Amazon and we stayed in, in this uh, really, really deep jungle environment. And I was just walking around in my board shorts barefoot through mm -hmm. the jungle for mm -hmm. about a week. And I felt amazing. I felt so yeah. good afterwards. And yeah. um, that, that probably played a big role in it. And, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, amazing. So, so I live in a sapphire mining community. And one thing I love to do is go fossicking because you get your hands in the dirt. And, you know, gardeners would automatically be experiencing the benefit of earthing because you've got that direct contact with, with the earth. And there's something very grounding and, well, earthing and grounding. that You feel the benefits. You feel grounded. You're in contact with the earth. And it's very, I think it really taps into something very primal within us. That's awesome. You know, you know it's more, a connectivity. Mm. Yeah. The, the more research that my wife and I do on all of these health things, it's just, it all comes back to the simplicity of just sort of how things were maybe a couple of hundred years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it seems like all of these technical, the, like technology that's been brought into our world seems to cause a lot of complications. And a lot of it hasn't really been yeah. tested. Um, so I, yes. I find that quite fascinating. And I like to try and keep it pretty simple. Um, your, your core message is the balance of the, the trinity of mind, body, and spirit. Um, how, do these, how do these work together, our, our mind, body, and spirit? Uh, it's, what, there's several different ways of looking at this, so I'm kind of scrambling for how I'm going to answer your question. Okay. Um, I don't think you can view them separately, especially when you consider human health. Mm. I think when you look at human health, they all play a, a massive, they all play a huge factor. When you look at the spiritual aspect, that taps into your belief systems and um, what do you base your decisions on? What, you know, what do you believe about how, humans interact with others how do we treat each other mm -hmm. um do we show mutual respect um you know those concepts um so each time and I, that we're having if, if we're if we're coming from a spiritual perspective or if there's something that's the spiritual part of this trinity it's directly affecting our body and it's directly affecting our mind for sure and our mind is directly affecting our body and our spirit and our body is Absolutely. directly affecting our mind and our spirit. And yeah. this seems like, and when we were talking about this earlier, uh, this is kind of like the angles that you come with, with your, with your healing and your therapy when you're um, treating people is you, you look at it from like a whole bunch of different angles to, to really bring some yeah. balance. Yeah. Uh, but I found even as a child, um, when I had health issues, I had to address some very core beliefs that I realized were, were flawed. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest, biggest issue with our belief system is do we feel connected or do we feel separate? When we feel separate, we're isolated, we're alone, we come from a place of fear and survival. It's scary. And the thing is, all of us have had experiences where we've felt separate and shut off and disconnected. But I think the most important part of our belief system is to recognize and realize that we are part of a, a connected system. We are, we are all interconnected and, and the same, in the same way we affect each other, you know, you know, you and your wife, you have a relationship. If one of you is off, the other one is going to feel it. Yeah. yeah. And it's the same, like, it's been discovered that plants are all connected underground. They have this, there's this underground network of connection. So you might have these two isolated 
well in Australia we have loads of gum trees you might have these two massive gum trees that are about 500 meters apart but there would be some form of connection underground that where they they are connected they're communicating and it's the same for us when we believe we are separate I think that's when we're more prone to disease and infection and um, other aspects of our health uh, you know the physical and the, the mental things go awry things go wrong when is, when we believe we're disconnected this is especially relevant right now especially with like the recent lockdowns and everything like that um yeah i, I think that it's got to have a big impact on how we actually feel and our health and everything like that not being as connected not walking up to everybody and giving each other a hug like we usually do and high-fiving each other and all of this and, and as you were saying this i was also listening and i was thinking well like the, the polar opposite of the connection that we have is like solitary confinement for someone in prison and apparently that's like one of the worst punishments that you can give to to really hardened criminals it's just lock them in completely by themselves in, in the dark and, and it's supposed to be miserable for them so yeah uh, well you're not getting you're not getting the feedback and the affirmation that's why that's why tools such as zoom has just they've gone off since the isolation because everybody wants that connection we want to feel connected and tuned in we we all need positive affirmation we need to we need confirmation that we belong to the people we love that they love us they love us and care for us and even if we can't feel their hugs we can see it on their faces mm. so yeah so these video conferencing um facilities are just so so popular at the moment because we crave that connection yeah it's like a way we're very to... tribal people yeah. That's amazing. essentially yeah well I, I tell you what joe like i mean we've talked about a lot of stuff today and there's so much more i want to talk about i really want to <laughs> delve into like the spiritual side of things with you but we can only fit so much into one show and i'd love to have you back to talk about more um and keep the conversation going um, before we take off though, um, now I know that you do both in-house and, uh, distance therapy sessions, and I know that you've helped improve the health of like hundreds of people all over the world. Um, how do our listeners continue the conversation with you or find out more about how they can connect with you? First of all, I want to say thank you for having me on the, on your show. It's been really exciting and it's, and um, it, it's so heartwarming to know that there, there are people who are seeking knowledge about, about health and, and wanting to Im, improve their health and in a very natural, positive way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I work, I work with people through Zoom sessions, Skype, telephone calls and so on. And um, my website, joedouglasbrown.com. Joe is the best way of contacting me. My email address is joe at joedouglasbrown.com. So and for everybody it's listening that right easy. now, we're going to have all of those links in the show notes um, so that you can have a conversation with Joe. And you can literally, you can be in a pilot seat. You could actually be in my position right now and have this conversation with Joe. I'm telling you what, I've got a lot out of this conversation. I've got a lot of out of our of our past conversations i really enjoy talking with you you're a wealth of knowledge on health you look at it from so many different angles thank you for sharing the knowledge that you share and improving lives because this is this is really really important and this is this is not the stuff that we're hearing about um and i really think it's important that we get this out there so thank you thank you so much for joining me today for all of our listeners um i hope you got a ton out of this and i know that probably some of you know if this is the first time you've heard about a lot of this or at least heard it on this deep at uh, this amount of detail it's probably a little bit overwhelming and you're probably thinking well how can i possibly implement all these things in my life so i would challenge you to take your biggest takeaway from today um maybe it was pH levels and you want to test the pH levels in your body, then go out there and try it. Go and get some pH strips, um, get mm -hmm. them from your local pharmacy, try it, um, try eating high, high alkaline foods, test the difference, see what it feels like. And then I know what it feels like. I've done this. I know it's awesome. And then once you see the results, come back, listen to this episode again. 
and listen to the next thing that um, tickled your fancy and that, that you thought, wow, I'd really like to make that improvement. And, um, and you can sort of keep listening over and over and go back and, and hit them one by one. And if you want to go deeper and deeper and you want to look into whatever the specific needs are that you have for your specific health issues or, or health concerns, then Joe is, is an amazing person to talk to. And, and I'm really excited for you to have that connection with us. So make sure that you do reach out to her and her, her details are going to be in the show notes as well. So, um, Make sure, I mean, look, we're here changing people's lives and we're here making people free so that they can live a freedom lifestyle. And so your interaction, guys, really makes a big difference. So if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the channel, give us a thumbs up, leave some comments, tell us what you think about it. And, you know, if you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, do the same, leave a review. The more people that know about this, the more people we can help. And you play a direct role in contributing to that. Your feedback, your interaction really, really, really does matter. So thank you very much for tuning in today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you very much, Joe. Um, this is Bryce Robertson tuning out. And, you know, live large, live free. I'll look forward to seeing you guys on the next episode.